Got it, got it. Yeah, there's a bit of a lag. Okay, so you're uh, I, I'm gonna close the window to prevent confusing myself. Um, hello, uh, friends who are not either Niels, Michael, or myself. Uh, yes, welcome to Zoom. Uh, there's no guarantee that we will not be Zoom bombed. Uh, yeah, so just a prior, prior warning. Um, in theory, this is supposed to start in uh, at seven, but like, is in actual in 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 actual fact is uh seven ish or whenever I feel like it. So uh, haha, we 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 see how. Um. So the YouTube is live now. Live huh? Mm hmm. Okay. What does this still say for waiting? I don't understand how YouTube works. I'm very confused. No idea. Let's see. Uh, Vishak, tell us about your exciting life. I just disturb Vishak every month. <laughs> Nothing so exciting. Uh, I've actually been attending a few interviews. Ooh, Hopefully, exciting. Sh -sh -sh -sh. Hopefully something should finalize soon. So okay. I'm just this hoping is kind of life. Best. So you also you don't want to share also never mind. But okay, we we'll all mentally cheer you on. All the best. Thank you. Like, <laughs> random undisclosed interviews. Haha. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, the reason that I'm dragging time uh, is also my second speaker is uh, not as not as punctual as news. News the bastion of reliability. My second speaker, slightly tardy, told me at 6.49, he told me I will be there in five minutes. Clearly, he has passed five minutes. I don't know which universe he lives in. I don't know like if his seconds to minutes conversion is slightly different, but I'm fairly sure <laughs> that was not five minutes. Oh, well. You know what they say about the Germans. We don't understand any jokes, but at least we are on time. So. <laughs> So yes, I love that. Like, like you've 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 like proven to the world that punctuality is very important. Oh, but are you 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 really were an art major, like, in school? Oh, uh, like you studied art in school, like for reals. Uh, history of art. Yeah. That's amazing. Okay, okay. Guess, guess, guess what I studied in uni. Just guess. <laughs> Ah, uh, something about the uh, music, maybe? No, no, so wrong. I stopped playing the piano when I was 12. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I restarted very, very recently, uh, thanks to thanks to Red Viola Panda Friend. You might see her later. Keep going, keep going. Um, oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's such no a... Idea. <laughs> So many options. It's like a most <laughs> open-ended quiz. Uh, geology, maybe. Psychology. Think Asian. Hello, hello, Asian. Chinese person, Chinese person. Uh, stereotype, stereotype. But not too, but not too extreme. So I'm well, like, this was my music guess, so... <laughs> Uh, no, no, no. Okay, Asian parents, right, will make the kid play the instrument. Uh, but when the instru when the kid tells the parent they want to be musician, their face is like, why? Why no doctor? But like, no, no, uh, no. <laughs> so math, maybe. Uh, okay, tangentially with accountancy. <laughs> oh. <laughs> finance, finance. Oh, oh. oh hey, look, my, my second speaker is here. Hello, Mr. Tan. I don't know what universe you live in. But your five minutes was longer than my five minutes, ne? Hello, sorry. <laughs> no, all this is already streaming live on YouTube. Everybody <laughs> knows you are late. Ha 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 ha. Okay, anyway, news, news. This is uh, Li Hao. Li Hao is uh, uh, our, our second speaker. Hello. Uh, yeah. He's actually same hometown as me. We are both Malaysians from the beautiful island of Penang. Uh, okay, okay. Now that Mr. Tan has arrived, uh, I think it's uh, yeah, and I am clearly ignoring the live stream, so I don't know how many people are there, but I will I will I will start this thing. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. My 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 screen is here. Uh, actually, I'm just talking to all of you here, right? Okay. Yes. Um, 
So news is is news is this your first time Singapore CSS, right? And I I would believe uh I, I'm not sure how to pronounce her name, but M Marik. Manaika. Hello, hello. I I Hi. is it your first time? Yes, when I'm oh. actually in the Netherlands. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Okay, we have two new people <laughs> here today. Uh, and have, one I have else a work meeting later. With the nonsense. So, okay, introduction time. Introduction time. Welcome. Welcome to the 54th edition of Talk CSS. Um, yes, moving on. Uh, we have a website. The website is hosted on GitHub because I have no operating budget. Uh, but I also have this uh, newsletter, which is basically a bunch of it's a, it's a word version of the news that I'm going to talk about later and I also like a bunch of links and then the, the recap for, for tonight's, uh, to this afternoon's, uh, for, for those of you in Europe, the, the meetup. So so can, can sign up if you like it, if you don't feel like it, it's fine. We are like a no hard sell organization. Um, okay, let me hit the record button. Actually, don't need to record, lah. this is nonsense. I will record when Neil starts speaking. Uh, yes, we have a code of conduct. We do not tolerate harassment of participants in any form. But now that I know all of you, I think you all, all behave yourself. But if anybody who I didn't know uh, don't want to behave themselves, we'll just kick them out. So that's that. Akong says, uh, for context, this is again, this is a very local, this is a very uh, uh, local meme, uh, but this is the founder of uh, Singapore. Uh, and he's been known to be a very, uh, he run the country very well, but very strictly. Uh, yeah, so we we just like use his face for a meme. Uh, rest in peace, PMD, moving on. Um, so shout outs, shout outs to engineers.sg, uh, the, the man, the legend himself, Mr. Cheng. Uh, and then we also want to shout out Chion. Uh, for those of you who don't know who is Chion, um, Chion is known as the Sweat King of Singapore because he prints, uh, no, no, he has extensive research. He has 5,000 word length essay research on, on sweat uh, in an Asian context. And he printed the first batch of Singapore CSS stickers. So we will always shout him out. We have shouted him out uh, every time we have a meetup. So yes, he's probably not here. He never shows up because he claims the timing is not good for him. So we just, you know, harass him. Uh, these are friends. Uh, we are friends. We are the sister meetup of Singapore JS, which is probably one of the longest running meetups in Singapore. We are also friends of another meetup called React Knowledgeable. They are on sabbatical now, but we'll talk a bit more about them later. Moving on, host of the month. The interwebs, that's where everybody is joining us from today. Uh, this is very important. This is CSS color of the month. Um, so there are 148 named CSS colors. Uh, clearly, there will be more CSS colors than talk CSS because, yeah, we are probably winding down soon. Uh, but anyway, today's CSS color of the month is powder blue. According to my notes, powder blue is a pale shade of blue and was originally uh, powdered smoked, which is a cobalt glass. This cobalt glass was used in laundering and dyeing applications in the 1650s and powdered smoke was a color name from 1894. Now powder blue itself was used as a color name in English in 1774, but nobody knows what the exact hue is, go figure. Now uh, powder blue, the reason why we have CSS name colors is uh, because someone made an executive decision to use the X11 colors uh, from the X, oh, my face is not working at 7 p.m. Uh, but from, from the X, des, the desktop desktop system, whatever. Anyway, uh, I have a link to the original Git commit, so I can tell you that it was added on the 31st of August, uh, 1989. I know some of you children weren't born yet. Uh -huh. um, and it was actually fixed the next day because I think uh, there was a huge issue. Uh, yes. Interesting and totally useless facts to share with all of you. They have no benefit to your welfare in whatever way. Today's agenda, yes, I will 
I will cut short my HTML and CSS news because I don't have one speaker. I have two. I have two speakers today. We have a fine gentleman who's joining us from Germany. Managed to trick him into becoming my speaker. Very very exciting topic. Uh, and then of course we also have Li Hao who will help all of us who like to know cool things but don't like to read article. Correct. More on that later. So now news time. Got what news? Okay. So browser release. Hey, I look at this. Uh, I look at the Firefox. Uh, I very sad. Uh. Uh, uh, I think as most of you all know by now, uh, Mozilla had a big, uh, let's call it a re -op. Uh, Um, I mean, they still they still release a stable version. Uh, so, so I will talk about the stable version. Nothing much exciting on the HTML and CSS front. Uh, the appearance property is now unprefixed. That is all. Okay, Safari Technology Preview is a, brow is a browser that I se secretly uh, support, like very, very support, um, because I've explained to numerous people before, is that uh, the WebKit team is very small, even though Apple very big and very rich. So the WebKit engineers, they, they whatever they ship in, into Technology Preview is guaranteed to uh, appear in the next uh, stable release. And they do a two week release cycle. So they actually put in a lot of new, exciting CSS properties. So if you are the type, they just want to like see what the new property is, right? I highly, highly suggest Safari technology preview. Also, people icon purple. Purple is such a nice color. Okay, anyway. Um, Chrome 85 has uh, also some, some, really, some updates. Uh, I'm actually quite excited to talk about Chrome uh, uh, or Google uh, this month. I will explain why later. But uh, for Chrome 85, uh, they have shipped this thing called content visibility, um, where, whereby it's, it's going to tell the browser to skip rendering work for, for a particular element until it scrolls into a viewport. So this is actually very exciting from a performance front, which, which makes sense. I think Google has always had quite an emphasis on the performance side of things. Uh, oh, now you can also define and set CS properties directly uh, in your CSS. Uh, actually, I should just click the link because I never bother to put the code example, but I got code example. What, what I want to talk about, uh, shameless plug, shameless plug to my friend, my friend whom I believe is the first Malaysian developer advocate for Chrome DevTools. Ding, 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 ding. So anyway, uh, this is... So for, for them, when they do these new updates, they usually come with a video. So this is the first time that she's on there. So I highly suggest everybody, everybody must go and watch. Um, but yeah, uh, actually DevTools did ship some uh, fairly interesting updates for 86. So, okay, DevTools shows media player information. Interest okay, they, they really extended the panel. That's cool. You can capture note screenshots. So meaning that instead of like the whole page, right, you can... I uh, I want to say the Firefox screenshot tool already does this, but hey, Chrome does it too now. Well done, well done, Chrome. Um, you can emulate missing fonts. That's a, that's a new feature. You can emulate prefers reduced data because reduced data is uh, one of the media queries. I think it's level, level five. Now, the reason Chrome has shipped it first because is the, um, the, the engineer who, who implemented it, he, he's, he's sitting in Chrome. And, and he also helped with, write, write out the, the, the spec. So, so uh, I think Chrome has this first. Uh, interesting to try try it out. Uh, you can, so you, it's a media query that allows you to serve like a different asset if your user has you know, made, made this, his, his preference known that, that they want like data saving. So yeah, uh, accessibility tools were improved. So there's now, color suggestion in the styles pane. So, so very good, very good, good stuff. Uh, on the spec side, okay, fairly uh, fairly average month, uh, three, three uh, modules were updated. So cascading and inheritance is actually its own spec. I don't know how many of you know this, but like, it's, it's they, they pulled it out of the, the original spec and like gave it a whole spec to explain. And now it's in level, level, level three is, Candidate recommendation level four is working graph. Uh, the TLDR of what, what's in this particular module is that it basically describes uh, how, how the star rules are collated and, and how these all the values are uh, 
assigned to to the different properties. So I I think if specificity specificity and inheritance is something that you're still a bit blur about, huh? there's actually a full spec dedicated to ex trying to explain this to you. So that's great. Uh, Grid also got updated uh, lately. Um, so uh, Grid is like everybody's like, okay, I won't say it's everybody, it's mine. It's my favorite like layout model. Uh, and then level two is what covers subgrid. Um, I don't remember exactly what got updated. So see, this is the reason for you to go and check it out. Um, the inline module, so inline layout, it also became its own thing fairly recently. Okay, not recently, but it's, it, a lot more work has been done on it recently. So the, the working draft is updated. Um, what it does it is the inline has always been around since the start, right? But so they, they extend what already exists uh, from, from all the CSS and there's an additional layout mode for drop caps. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, a few typography related uh, links also uh here i'm actually not really going to go through most of the links i just want to click on this one because it's very cool css 3d adventure uh yeah 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 someone apparently you can uh, do a 3d game rendered in css i like you you have a lot of time on your hands and I can respect that, but like, this is kind of cool. So all of these in the links, we'll send this out. Um, and okay, I'm going to hand the time over to Nils. I'm going to stop sharing. And then Nils, you, you cannot stop, uh, start talking until I tell you to start because I need to hit the record button, but like share your, share your screen first, share your screen first. Okay. Let me see if this works. Okay, I'm gonna start recording. Okay, yeah, you can start anytime you want. Okay, <laughs> yeah, I, um, I think I, um, I, I'm, I'm ready to start. So uh, if you see my screen, uh, then everything is fine. Okay, so, uh, well, <laughs> again, uh, thanks for, for having me here and, and uh, admitting uh, me to this meetup uh, without knowing what exactly I'm going to do and uh, and how I do my talks, but well, here I am. Um, I want to give a very very short introduction about myself. Uh, simply saying, uh, well, I am Niels. Um, I work at a company called Nine Elements. Uh, we are based in Bochum. And if you want to talk to me and contact uh, me, you find me on Twitter. Um, if you maybe want to talk to me, but say please, no more CSS stuff. You can also talk to me about paper folding. I love origami. Uh, so this is kind of thing that I do when I'm not doing uh, front-end design stuff. So, but that's uh, everything for, for me. Um, I will go on with my talk now. So when I started uh, doing web design, web development about like uh, 10 to 20 years ago, everything was uh, really easy. We had the design part, then we had the front end development and the back end development. And over the last years, uh, something new emerged here that is called uh, front end design. I think it was uh, Brett Frost who came up with the term. Sometimes it's referred to as uh, UX engineering or interface development, but it is all the same. Um, what it is, if you haven't heard this term before, it is uh, people that are interested in HTML, CSS, and uh, presentational JavaScript. And um, I will write down some things, uh, there are some tasks that you can, uh, can do during a web development process. And I think we could argue about every single word here for like hours, but uh, this is not the point here. What I want to say is that on the far left side, you have something that is clearly uh, belongs to the design part, say doing some illustration, drawing stuff, doing photography. And then this starts with the user interface design, UX design, and you go over to the far right end where you have this API stuff, data storage, uh, business logic, and so on. And what is interesting for me is that when companies are try searching for a full stack developer, full stack development means something like this to them. So we have to do everything 
except for maybe drawing an illustration. So, but you have to have at least a basic knowledge about user interface design, because this is what you're building in the end, a user interface. And uh, you have to do everything. This is a full stack developer. Um, but I was always asking myself, how do you do you learn this? And uh, when you start learning things, uh, I saw this little meme here that you, you're a newbie and you just jump everything. You start with React and then you apply at Facebook. And for some time, this bothered me and I got quite angry about this because I think I value CSS and HTML and I think this is so important. But this changed a little bit for me because I think it is okay to, to do this. If you're interested in JavaScript frameworks and all this stuff, then please do this and do this because you cannot uh, learn everything at the same time. But we all have to acknowledge that if people are more, more and more interested in this, the full stack development becomes more something like this. And if we have on the one hand, people that are doing just pure design stuff. And on the other hand, we have people starting with presentation of JavaScript. It means there is no front end design at all. And if you have no front end design, you will end up with uh, something like this. You have your expectations on the one hand, but the reality is kind of not what you wanted to have. So this is why we need front end design. And I'm kind of focusing on this part here um, because the problem we now had in our company, for example, is where do we find people that are excited about front end design? And um, well, I can say by myself, I don't know if I'm any good, but I uh, at least can say that I love all this stuff that has to do with uh, UI design, UX design, HTML, also accessibility, speed. I just love this, uh, these languages. And I looked and saw, well, what did I do before I did, uh, before I started um, web design, web development? And I studied the uh, history of art. And I thought maybe I did learn something there that helps me nowadays uh, when I do my work as a front end designer. And I think I found some things there. And um, I want to share this with you so that maybe there is something that can help you as well. So uh, I will show you a couple of paintings and we will start with a very easy one. This one here, I love this painting. It is uh, by Robert Rauschenberg and it's called White Painting. Uh, this the seven panel version here. It's from 1951. And uh, just to be clear, this is not one painting with uh, small lines on it. It is uh, like uh, it has seven panels, so seven canvases, very narrow, and they are put next to each other and they are painted with white paint. Uh, there's also the four panel version and the three panel version. Then you have the two panel version and of course also the one panel version. Uh, but don't mistake this one with this painting here. This is by uh, also an artist called Robert, but this is by Robert Ryman. And I think it's from 1965, so 14 years later. So we see it's something completely different. So back to this one here where we have the Robert Rauschenberg seven panel white painting. What I really like about this painting is uh, there was nine years after he painted it, there was an exhibition, I think somewhere in Norway, I don't know, at least in Europe, and he was living in the United States. And uh, uh, they wanted to have uh, his paintings for this exhibition. And uh, Robert Rauschenberg said, well, um, transporting these and having them on the plane, they could be damaged. This is kind of expensive. Uh, I'll tell you what to do. See. Um, you know, you have uh, the size of the canvas at seven times 100 and roughly 80 centimeters by 45 centimeters. The paint is uses latex paint. And then he said, paint them so they look like they haven't been painted. No hand, just put a coat of paint on them. And then there was his assistant, Bryce Martin. He traveled to uh, the museum and he painted them, doing his best to uh, do uh, what uh, the artist told him and painting the pictures. And then we have them. Here uh, it is uh, the painting. And what's interesting now is what was printed beneath it. And it said Robert Rauschenberg, 1951. So um, 
what this process is, it reminds me kind of how a website is rendered, because you could say that this is the HTML and CSS. This is the introduction of how the final painting should look like. Then we have the browser doing his best here, the assistant, to interpret the information and building the final painting. And we have the rendered website here. So this is kind of cool, I think, that you have this painting in a digital form where you uh, you have like the digital information about the painting and then you have the analog uh, painting itself in the museum. And if you want to, you can paint it yourself and have an original Robert Rauschenberg uh, in your living room if you have enough space to put it there. So this is uh, our first painting that I like. and. Uh, the next one uh, is maybe a little more of you know this one. It's by uh, Marguerite. Uh, and I don't speak French, so don't make me uh, read uh, the title here. It's from 1929, so we're going a little bit uh, back in, the, uh, in time. And uh, yeah, what we're seeing here, at least we are seeing something here now, is a pipe. And underneath it, there's uh, this little sentence, Ceci n'est pas une pipe, which translates to this is not a pipe. And I always think about this painting here when I'm uh, looking at some, some layout done in, let's say, Sketch, Figma, whatever you like. Um, and I'm thinking, well, what we're seeing here is not a website. Um, you may have done this yourself, like saying, okay, this may look like a website, but it is not a website in the end. You can do a prototype, but still it is not a website. And the same uh, thinking is going on here. We are, we are seeing uh, there's this painted pipe, but it is not a pipe at all. And uh, funny thing here is even if you wanted to build a pipe from this paint here, you have to know quite a lot about pipes to actually build it. You have to know that it's open at the far right end. You have to know its size, the material it is made of. So in the end, this is just a representation of a pipe and it is not a pipe just as uh, a layout is and never will be uh, a real website. Okay now you see these lessons are getting a little shorter here. Uh, we're going uh, even more uh, traveling back in time a little more to this uh, beautiful painting here by uh, Georg Flegel. It is called uh, Stillleben mit Käse und Kirschen uh, which translates to still life with cheese and cherries. And it's from 1635. I think it is the smallest of the paintings we're having here. It's uh, uh, like a regular paper or something, if I'm, I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And uh, well, coming from the white painting to the pipe one, there is quite a lot of stuff going on here in this painting. You see there's the glass of wine on the left and we have the silver plate. Uh, arranged on it is the cheese. Uh, I don't know if you see my cursor. Uh, this is the cheese, by the way, uh, and the knife and the bread and a, a dragonfly on top of it. And uh, then we have some almonds uh, and some berries and some cherries scattered around all there. So this is what, what's uh, shown on this painting. Uh, for those of you who are uh, know the Christian religion, uh, you may already have seen that on this painting there is much more going on. We have everything from uh, original sin to Jesus, Jesus' crucifixion, uh, resurrection, and final salvation is on this. And uh, for those of you who did not see this at first glance, I will try to explain this. So. Uh, Everything started uh, with Adam and Eve in paradise. And then there was this original sin thing going on, Eve eating the apple. Uh, and this, he, she was seduced by the devil and the devil in form of a snake. And you have the snake uh, in the glass uh, here on the bottom left corner. And uh, we don't have an apple here, but we do have cherries and cherries are also symbols for um, fruits from paradise, so they work as well. We also have, uh, right where the original sin starts, uh, we have to talk about a prophet. The prophet, if you are a Christian and you believe this, uh, is Jesus. And uh, these almonds here are a symbol for Jesus. Um, all nuts, by the way, are symbols for Jesus because um, his, uh, the, the hard shell here is a symbol for his suffering and the soft fruit is a symbol for his kindness. 
So this is uh, the talk of the prophet going on here. You also have these berries here. In uh, German, they are called Johannisbeeren. If you translate this word by word, it would mean John berries. And you have John the Baptist. So Jesus is baptized around here and you have his life going on. And uh, if you know, Jesus' life did not end very well. He was crucified and you have the cherries here, which are the evil fruit, you know, from the beginning, building a cross down here. So this cross is uh, the symbol for Jesus' crucifixion. But his life did not really end. He was resurrected and he died for our sins. And you have this holy communion thing uh, where in church now you eat bread in the symbol of uh, Jesus' uh, body. Um, and this is the bread is up here and it's alongside the knife. And the knife is pointing up against the reading direction because uh, you're reading in Western languages from left to right. So this is the reading direction and the knife is pointing upwards against it. So very strong uh, up, upwards uh, drift here and it's pointing to the wine and the wine is a symbol for Jesus' blood and the bread and the blood is what finally crashes the snake down here and gives us in the end salvation. Bow. So this is what's all going on here in this painting and I could now also start talking about alignment and golden ratio and all of this stuff but I don't want to bore you too much with this. Um, you might already ask yourself, what has, does all of this have to do with uh, front-end design and how can this help me in my daily work? Well, I will tell you. Um, you hopefully have learned now that every element here has a distinct purpose that uh, 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 has a uh, yeah, it, it, its own purpose and also its place on the painting is very important. Like, uh, this wine here, you could maybe change it to red wine, it would work as well, but you could not uh, switch it with milk because uh, milk does have uh, very other symbols here. And also these cherries in the far right corner, they have to form this cross. It's really important to, to know all this uh, Jesus stuff. So you analyze this painting here and you ask yourself, what's the purpose of every single element and what's its job and how can I preserve this when I need to do any modifications here? And this is what we are doing now when, when looking at a very simple layout and trying to, uh, to use what we have learned here. So uh, we have this layout given to you by your designer friend, and then you can use whatever tool you want, let's say it's Envision or Sketch or uh, Figma, whatever, to, to know all the numbers here, to know um, all the margins and paddings. And there's something quite strange going on in this layout here. You see this uh, large headline is not centered. Um, it is uh, in here is kind of a container and inside it there's an additional margin going on here. And you could translate all of these pixel values to some CSS. And um, as this is a CSS uh, meetup, I think you are all familiar with CSS. So I named this whole thing fancy text. And then I mostly uh, took all the pixel values and put it here. So we have the font size, line height, margin, font weight, all of this. But you all know that as soon as I started to resize my browser and narrow the screen, this layout would break um, and I needed some media queries to, to fix this. And uh, well, this is maybe not the best approach. So I want to show you some, something that is a little different here. So instead I look at this thing here again and ask myself, what's the uh, artist's intention here? So the designer's intention. And there are three things that I think are kind of important for this layout here to work. First thing is this headline here. It is really huge. You see there, it is not about readability anymore. This is a headline that spans nearly the whole um, space that is available here. So um, this is kind of a substitute for an image that's not there. The, uh, designer wanted you to stare at the typography and, and acknowledge this beautiful letters here. So this is what's going on in the headline. Um, the paragraphs are a little different. Here it is really about readability. We have a nice uh, width of the paragraph. We have a nice uh, line height and so on. So this is mostly about 
uh, this is the content, the real content that you have to read, and this is done about readability. And the last thing that is interesting is the layout itself. You see, you have some space up here, then you have the text indented over here, and a little bit less space on the right one. So this is the third thing that I kind of want to preserve. And how do I do this? I start with the headline, and uh, instead of looking at these 160 pixels, I kind of compare this uh, to uh, the whole viewport, which is 1,440 pixels in this case, because this seems to be the new normal when you're working on a design. Um, and instead of using pixels, I go for viewport units. And I always keep a little bit of M in here. Um, I'm told this is better for uh, accessibility, but the most, uh, the major part of it will be done by viewport units. You see that's 10 viewport units, uh, which makes the text size uh, change dramatically once you change uh, the browser width. So this stays almost um, always as big as possible uh, given the browser size. So this is for the headline. Um, now looking at the paragraph here, the width of the paragraph is 720 pixels. And I could go now for a max width of 720 pixels. But again, here I want to see, okay, what is 720 pixels? And in this case, it's the width of uh, 50 times the character zero. And this, uh, knowing this, I can use this in uh, CSS and setting a max width of 50 characters. And the CH unit is the width of the letter zero. So uh, it's even better than using M because if for some reason there was uh, another font loaded here that is much more narrow or wide, um, I'd still have the same number of uh, characters in this paragraph. And this is what you're aiming when you're doing setting a max width for a good line length. So uh, this is the character unit that I'm using here. And that's the second part. And the third one and final one is this uh, distribution here that we have. Um, and again, we're having the pixel values 230, 344, and 114. They look really random. But if I compare them a little, we could say roughly uh, the far right corner uh, column here is one third. This is uh, two times this um, column here. And 344 is roughly three times uh, the third column. And they are mostly empty. So it, it is kind of white space. And distributing white space is something that you could not do in CSS for a long time, but finally with the grid, you can do it. And this is, I think this is really awesome that you can do this. So uh, what I'm doing here is uh, I'm using grid for laying out this uh, little layout here. And it's not too complex. Uh, mainly what I'm saying here is I use the fraction unit and the fraction unit uh, works in a way that uh, the browser asked, hey, is there, after I put in all the content that I have, is there some space left? And if yes, then it gets, gets distributed like two times here, three times here, and one time over here. And then I only have to place uh, my headline here, uh, starting at the second line, this would be here. First one would be here on the far left and ending at the fourth line and the paragraphs starting at the third line and ending here as well. Okay, combining all of this together, um, the CSS looks like this. You see, we have the fancy text. This is the uh, outer diff or whatever you're having here. There's a grid thing uh, I talked about just yet. Then you have the headline with the calculated font size and placed to the grid column. The rest is just line height, font weight, and so on. And you have the paragraph. I put in a tiny bit of viewport width here as well, but not as much as I did here, just a tiny bit. So it gets a little larger when I'm uh, on a big screen and the max width here to 50 characters. So when I compare this one to the initial CSS that I showed you, then, well, yeah, it did get a little bit more complex. You see, we had 19 lines here and we have 21 lines here, but it is not too complicated, I think. And instead of having a layout that breaks whenever uh, you start resizing your browser, we now have a perfectly responsive 
layout that um, doesn't need any media query and preserves the designer's intention. And I will show you how it looks. You see here how the indention is, is changing and you always have this nice readable paragraph here and you have this one third over here, three times the width down here. And you see if, as long as it's uh, very narrow, we only have one column because uh, yeah, there's no space left. And I can show you again how this looks. Here you can see how the white space is distributed here uh, with the pink uh, columns. So, and uh, you see what I think is really important here that we have the designer's intention, the indented uh, text in, in the bottom, the really large headline that is uh, always quite large and the good readable paragraphs uh, underneath it. So the next time when you get a layout and you see a layout, which is not a website, and I hope uh, you do understand this all the time, please try to analyze where the things are, what the element's purpose is, and try to preserve it. And this is, um, for me, what uh, front-end design is really about. And I hope that in the future, front-end design will get the love uh, that it deserves. And uh, well, with that, I say uh, thank you very much for, for listening. And uh, I think if you do have any questions uh, whatsoever, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. That was amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. Yes, uh, everybody. Okay, imaginary applause. I'm just going to clap into the uh, microphone. Thank you. Yay. Um, so like, just in case uh, you didn't realize uh, the, the general uh, reception from a, a Asian audience is nobody's gonna ask any questions. Um, <laughs> I, I, I know that already. Yeah. Uh, I think there's nothing Asian. <laughs> yeah, so, um, but anyways, um, I'll let everybody kind of just settle their blown minds. Uh, and, and if they have any que questions, I'm sure they could pin you on Twitter or they could ping us and then we'll pin you on Twitter. But yes, thank you once again for that amazing talk. Okay, everybody, uh, next up we have uh, Mr. Tan, Mr. Tan Li Hao. Uh, yes. You are going mm -hmm. to share with us a very insidious and evil topic. What do you mean third party CSS is not safe? So yes, uh, please do your screen sharing thingy. Okay. Um... Uh, sorry, okay. sorry for the hideous. Wow. Uh, Why your desktop <laughs> like that? Hiya! Uh, <laughs> because it's easy. Uh, no. I just took a lot of screenshots and it's all there. I'm uh, judging you, <laughs> bro. Come on. So, okay. Are you gonna uh, do the sharing? Or you uh, just gonna go like with the sidebar? Okay, hold on. Uh, I think like, like this, is it okay? I mean, I mean because I, I need to click link and yeah, yeah. No, I don't mind. I just want to know when to hit. I, I'm just going to start recording now. Like, okay, click sure. Post. Can. Let's go. Okay, let's go. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, today I'll be talking about third party CSS is not safe. Uh, why? Because, uh, uh, one day I just read this article and then I find it very interesting. And I am pretty sure this article has come out, came out in 2018. Everyone sh may have if read it, but uh, if you have not, you should go and read it. But if you are lazy to read and lazy to understand all these words, uh, today let's read it together. I, uh, because you know, uh, you have no choice. I will be reading this together with you. So what is third party CSS? Uh, I think the first paragraph we just skip first, later we'll come back. Uh, so third party image, third party, right? Meaning uh, content or files that is not from your own domain. 
for example, you are working at say singaporecss.github.io, uh, anything that is outside of that domain is third party, right? Um, okay, this is supposed to, okay, okay. Right, so he, so he started with like third party images. Uh, why it's not safe? Uh, it's because if say you were think you initially you were thinking of like you know and use some URL from other websites. I mean, and then it you, it was supposed to be a kitten image, but then suddenly the uh owner of the website changed that kitten image to something disgusting. Uh, you it will make your website looks ugly, right? Uh, so. Uh, so that's why you shouldn't trust third-party images. Uh, third-party script is even worse because you ex if you are actually going to execute whatever is written in the script, so they can actually read and do everything that your uh, on your website that you just treat them as like your own script that kind. Um, and then lastly is third party CSS. And that is the main topic of like, why is it not safe, right? Before we start about why we talk about it is not safe, let's look at what, where does this all third party CSS come from? So, so it's not written in the blog. This is like, I own self come up one. Cause I'm thinking like, where do I got all this CSS, right? I mean, I'm building our own website. My CSS is all written by myself, right? I don't copy paste from Stack Overflow or anywhere. Should be safe, right? But where, where does this all third party CSS coming from? Uh, so I have a few examples. Firstly is you may, okay, this is not against like bootstrap, but if you go to some CSS frameworks, uh, sometimes you will see them telling you how you can use the CSS from CDN. Basically, you just copy this link and then they will load their CSS into a website, right? So unless you are telling me you will actually click into the link and look at all the contents, make sure they are safe. I presume most likely you just copy and paste, you allow whatever they're going to style your website. Right? So this is like one of the place where the party CSS is coming from. Another place would be, uh, this is like, if you go to some website, right? I believe, okay, let's go to Shopee. Uh, so if you look at the network tab and then you will realize, how come my network tab doesn't open? Okay, you'll realize that not all requests goes out to Shopee actually. If you do something like, let's filter out Shopee Right. Uh, sorry. As you do out Shopee, you still see uh, scripts that is loaded from, say, Google Analytics, uh, Critio, which is like a ads network, and all these things. Right. They are not from Shopee, and that's because they want to track you. Uh, they want to know. Uh, they want to like they they are relying this other networks, social networks to uh, to have targeted uh, um, advertisement for you, right? So basically, uh, I think your website may have it because you want to track like the analytics of people coming in. Also, you want to make advertisement when they go to visit like google.com and then they should see some ad advertisement because they come here to your site, they don't want to buy things and then you go and uh, add advertisement on Google to ask you to come back to buy, right? Do you actually look at what uh, all this uh, script contains? They can actually add, they can, I, I mean, if, if they are really nice enough not to run bad things on JavaScript, but they can still add CSS on your website and style it and may screw your website. All right, that is one of the place. And then lastly, I think some of us like to turn our website, want to make it nice, a browser, and they want to make it nice. We install, extensions from like web store. Uh, and then this will actually inject CSS, right? Because they want to style your browser and style your website. Um, do you actually really look into what the CSS they are doing? Uh, maybe something malicious. 
right? So, so here are like the three places where, where the third party CSS comes in. Uh, so what can they do, right? I mean, CSS should just able to, you know, style your website, uh, make style changes. Uh, what, what harm can they do to your website? And the first one, which is, I think the most interesting one would be that you can actually uh, steal your password. But uh, I will leave this at the very end. Let's look at something malicious, but simple first. So the first one is about disappearing content, right? So they can actually hide certain contents of your website and then make your website looks like it's down, but it's just maybe a simple line of CSS like display none. So I'm going to try out whether, I mean, for the sake of trying out, let's see how this works, right? So um, here I have one Chrome extension installed in my website, uh, in my browser, and it will actually load uh, CSS in the browser. So if I, if you look at here, it will load, it will just inject this hacker.css into the browser app all the pages that I'm visiting, okay? Right now it's it's an empty, it's an empty CSS, but let's see what we can. So, so this CSS is coming from uh, this file. Sorry, where is my static CSS? Okay, so it's from this file, right? So let's do a simple, like hiding a content CSS. So I could just do this. And then I refresh, uh, it will looks as if your CS, talk CSS today got no speaker. No one is speaking, uh, got no detail, right? I mean, it's just one line of CSS and you can do so much harm to your website. And what's even worse is that they can, so here we have a RSVP button, but we can actually do some CSS to Say, oh, holy, sorry. I removed the, they can just say, they can change your text to say refresh and then it's actually RSVP. So they can trick you to go somewhere else that you, are, you don't want to go, right? So how we do this, right? We can take a look. It's actually, uh, firstly, we, we do a display none to hide everything. Uh, we, to add text, right, random text, you can use uh, before or after, and then use the content. Let me zoom uh, big, big on the CSS panel over here. So we can add content. Uh, so we can actually add any content, right? And then for the button, it used to be RSVP. Right now, uh, what we do is actually we have, sorry, we overlay a, uh, a ref word on top of, so we, we just add the word, oops, sorry. Ah, then we, yeah, basic, we, we add after, we add a content and then we just draw the words on top of it. And then maybe we add the background or something to cover it up. And then you will looks like, this button is supposed to refresh instead of uh, RSVP, right? It's just a few lines of CSS and it can do so much harm. So careful with the CSS that you are adding to your website. Next thing would be adding content. So similar to hiding, adding, right? I think just now I, my examples kind of bleed into it, but this one is quite interesting where uh, you, you can actually, uh, make nuance changes to the website. Unlike this one, you can add numbers in front of the prizes. So one example would be, add, you see like Shopee, they say flash deal, very cheap. But how about we just add some CSS to make it, make all the price become more expensive. We can add like, 
we can try to target, we can like inspect and see uh, the class is, sorry. Uh, uh, sorry, I got this panel, okay. The, you can find the span where it says the price. We just need to add a before to add more numbers in front. So now if we refresh, you'll notice that the price is no longer cheap and it's much more expensive and it's not like flash deal anymore. What a slow website. Yeah, so it looks very expensive now, but it feels a bit fake though, like all the prices are marked up by like one zero zero in front. It feels like a very fake uh, prefix. So I was think so that reminds me of like one very nice article uh, that was from Lea Veru, Veru, if I pronounce it correctly. Uh, it's about cicada principle. So uh, basically, okay, I'm not going to read this for you already. So you can read it, uh, Lea Veru. Um, basically you can use prime numbers to create patterns to make it uh, less, obvious patterns that's coming out, right? Maybe, so here, what I'm going to do is, sorry, hey, where's my, okay. I'm going to like add prizes, like random numbers at random places, random uh, repeti repetitions. And then if I do that, it feels less, Less fake, right? The numbers comes, uh, yeah, the numbers is what? It's not updated. Oh, sorry, I forgot to save. You'll make the price looks less fake where some prices are marked up by 20,000, some is maybe 30,000 and you kind of doesn't get the sense of what is going on here, right? This is a very slow website. Okay, I think I feel doing it, something is not right. But anyway, uh, what else we can use uh, adding content to uh, break a website? So I was thinking like, besides using this very like e-commerce website, I think one of the example I can, I think of is, um, is OCBC like banks website, right? Uh, if you can add a style, uh, what things you can do that is not cracking, but slightly breaking the website. I was thinking that you can see like phone number over here. We never verify whether this is actually from OCBC. Uh, what about, you know, change it. So uh, I have, a CSS over here that will do the job. Basically, what it does is that it will add after tag, after a pseudo element, and then put a content that, uh, and with a position absolute, uh, place it overlay on top of the original phone number, and then put a background so that you just cover the original number up. And okay. When I was doing it, it was in a landscape mode. Yeah, there you go. Like you can change the phone number and people will just, you know, people will just call this number instead of the actual phone number of OCBC and you can uh, be nice. Next thing is moving content. So besides just doing con like uh, adding random stuff that is malicious, you can actually move the content around that, uh, in a way that is malicious as well. So one of the examples they're given here was to, you know, make one of the like delete button or buy now button to be big enough and transparent that covers um, the entire site. And people, whenever they just click anywhere on the site will just go there, right? So one of the example I can think of is using a Singapore CSS websites again. I expand, I, I, 
basically go and style the RSVP button to make it like it's everywhere. Uh, you can't see it now, but if you notice that admeup.com is showing because it's on hover. So anywhere you press on the Singapore CSS will go to the Meetup RSVP site. Yay. Uh, next thing um, is about reading attributes. So we slowly towards, uh, move slowly towards where you can actually sniff data from the user, right? So uh, attributes like, um, so, so you can have, so CSS has this attribute selector where you can select an attribute and you can uh, use like prefix, uh, you can use like a dollar sign or you use a caret sign that you can target where the attribute starts with a certain characters or end with a certain characters. Also you have like, uh, uh, you can actually target whether the select uh, attribute value has a certain uh, characters inside, right? So what you can do here is actually try to target value. Uh, and then if it's one, six, maybe it starts with one or two or three, you do something different and then try to sniff it out. But how do you sniff that out? Uh, basically what you can do um, is try to add background image because when you have a background image, uh, it will the browser will actually try to load that image, right? And that image can be a source of, can be hosted in your server. Basically you can know what, uh, what request is coming in and based on that, you're kind of able to say, uh, you're kind of able to know what is, uh, what, what number is in front of the value, right? If you're using like a, so one thing I tried here was that I noticed that OCBC login site, um, like, so usually forms when you want to prevent um, course, wait, that's not course. You want to prevent cross site resource forgery. Basically you want to prevent people from calling an API from somewhere else. Uh, you would add like a hidden value or CSRF token or something like that, right? So in this OCBC form over here, uh, you have something similar as well. Uh, it's like this random, see these are like random generated strings that, that secures this session. But what if we can target them? Like we can target this ID of a random number model and then we also add an attribute selector to select where if it starts with eight, we load some image. If it starts with seven, we load another image, right? And then basically we can start to guess each numbers and eventually with enough CSS, you can sniff out this value and do some nasty stuff. So, uh, sorry, this is not the code. Yep, I written some CSS. Uh, so it will try to, hold on. Uh, it's local host, right? Uh, yep, it will try to load image in a local host. So basically I have a server running locally uh, and any request goes to the server will, will, you will see a log over here. Okay. So let's, I think I'm doing it right. Let's refresh this page and take a look at the network. Uh, or, or image. Okay. Refresh. Oh, my laptop is getting slower because of the screen sharing, but Let's try to hold this through. Okay, so I think it works. Uh, the first character, like the, the there's an A character inside, but it doesn't load the website. Uh, it doesn't reach my server. And yeah, let's let's look take a look at what's going on over here. 
basically it says that it's being blocked by CSP. So what is CSP? Um, so CSP is actually content security policy that says that um, your website can only load a specific list of images from a specific list of uh, uh, trusted sources, right? Uh, so localhost apparently is not one of them. That's why it doesn't load images from localhost. So how do you, uh, this is also part from part of in the blog that says how you should do, which is you should set a CSP to prevent loading images or scripts from untrusted sources, right? So let's take a look how uh, OCBC set this up. Uh, if you look at the doc, uh, look at this website, right? Uh, the response header, the CSP is, uh, is written in the response header. So this list is telling you like what are the trusted um, domains of uh, assets that can be loaded. Right. I think it's a bit messy over here. So I, I copied it out into this slide and let's take a look. So in content security policy, you can actually you, you can break it down to different types of assets, right? You can say styles can be from anywhere, uh, but the font can only from a certain domains and image can be only from a certain domains as well, another different sets of domains. And if it doesn't match like the asset type, then maybe fall back to the default one, right? So these are the list of trusted sources and apparently localhost is not one of them. So a way to work around would be, I mean, to, to make our proof of concept, make sure that it works. Uh, let's try to fake that our server is, our images is actually hosted in gstatic.com. So it's a star.gstatic.com. So maybe like a subdomain of a gstatic.com. So I have preset this up. Uh, so I'm going to tell you like what I've done. So firstly, I add, uh, app.gstatic.com into etc host. Uh, so this is this tells uh, and and redirect to one two seven, which is a local host. Uh, sorry, this is uh, not too much CSS related, but uh, bear with me. I try to explain it as simple as possible. So basically, th what this does is that uh, any request that goes to this domain will go to local host. Uh, that's all. Uh, and then I realized. Uh, I, when I tried it out, I realized that I need to be on HTTPS as well. Uh, so to do that, I need to have a cert certif uh, for, to sign my uh, HTTPS. So I install a, a bunch of things to make that work. And then finally, I able to start my server in HTTPS. Um, okay, so, so what, that's, what that means is that now we just fake saying that our request uh, let, let's go to this site and let's change it to app.gstatic and hopefully all the requests will go to our local server. Let me try this out first. Uh, oh, hold on. Let me restart the server because uh, if you're interested in how the server works, uh, basically I generated the key and then I start the HTTPS server, right? So let me copy this to my default express server. Okay, and let me start over here. So now if I visit, it will, so whatever request is being logged out here, right? So let's go back to OCBC and take a look. Um, let's refresh. Oh, wow, so slow. Yep, so there's a request coming in telling me that uh, that key ends with five, right? So theoretically, uh, if I'm diligent enough because I want to hack OCBC, I just have to copy and paste all this to you know cover all the digits and hopefully that way 
I could um able to read out what is in the random number, right? And I hope that convinced you that uh uh CS you should add CSP uh because sorry you should add CSP uh content security policy so that you can limit the um as third party so that you can limit your websites from from loading uh, untrusted third party scripts or assets right let's look at let's take a look at what else is being listed here i think we are almost at towards the end um one thing that is interesting uh that it mentioned in the blog is that you here I have a simple React application that has an input. Over here is a password field. So if I type password, you shouldn't see the value over here. But if you take a look at the DOM, if you inspect it, ah, oh, my laptop is so slow. Or oh, Chrome is slow. Please, I'm going to show some. Yeah, if you take a look at the DOM, you would notice that the value that you typed in, you notice that the value you typed in is in the attribute. And um, this is by the framework design, but it kind of is a vulnerability to your website where you can use the similar way to actually sniff like a third party uh, styles could potentially sniff out what password that you typed in so this value updates um, synchronously as you type uh, okay hopefully this layout is not too bad but I just to prove it out if I type this exact Z is Z right now and C is Z C right now, right? This is React's way of trying to synchronize whatever you type and whatever is in the element is in sync, but somehow it leaks out the value uh, of your password input. Uh, on, on this end, uh, I think they mentioned about what you could do, but nothing much you can do for now, except, I don't know, it doesn't say how you should work around with this. Probably don't use React when you, you are doing the input uh, input field. A password input field, maybe. Uh, lastly is you can use CSS to actually track interaction of a user on the website. So, um, if you're using like things like hover or active, basically you can change the style, load a different image when the user is hovering or uh, clicking on the web website, right? So here I have like interaction, uh, sniffing CSS. Same thing, let's do it on the Singapore CSF website because it's, it loads faster. So let's open up my terminal, hide it smaller. Uh, let's see. Okay, so hope you can see both. So if I hover on top, I get a request because when upon hover, it's loading an image. Uh, and now when I click on it, it will send another request, right? You can use just CSS to track interaction of any websites, right? But Using this trick, right? There's one thing you need to know is that um, when once you load the image, it's being cached by the browser. So when you do it multiple times, it doesn't load the image anymore. So the the limitation of this hack to sniff out data can only do it once, like kind of like unless it refreshes again and it will load the it will load the image again, right? So that concludes all the basic ones and let's go back to the last one which is the keylogger uh, which uses the same technique as this uh, reading text 
way of doing it, uh, of, of sniffing data. So uh, how do you read whatever text is on the screen? Uh, basically, what you can do is that you can declare a different font for the paragraph. And for each font, uh, for, so, so for example, you can set uh, a, the same font family called blah for all the, when you're declaring a font face, but for different variants of that font, right? You can say you can you can have load from a different files uh, for a specific Unicode range. So uh, this is useful in a case where maybe like you want to have just you just need to specify one font, but um, for maybe say emoji, you want to use a different font uh, font fa uh, different font files for certain emojis and for certain maybe. Unicode characters, say Chinese characters, you use a different font again, but you use the same font family. So when you style your CSS, you just write one font family, but you can have different, uh, one font family can describe a, a, a variance of the font files that you can load for different Unicode range. Right, so, uh, so, so basically if you have a character queue in the web page and it matches this then it will loads your it will loads the file and it you use the same same thing as so so you can sniff it from the server right so so let's go to google.com because it has a very big input over here and what i'm going to do here is that uh, i want to set a font family on the input itself and then for different characters, uh, I will load the different font files. And that way I can actually sniff out what is being typed, right? So it could be happening on like password fields as well. So you can use a combination of different like attributes or font loading a font and you can basically uh, sniff out the data. So that's here. Okay, so here is much simpler version of the code. So you have different Unicode range and then you use the same font family for that and it should load, it should load a different, oh wait, it doesn't load a different file. Let's key equals one, this is two, right? So it loads a different URL and then you can kind of differentiate it. So you just do it enough of font face, then you, you should be able to figure out what is being typed out. Okay. So I kind of forget what is the character for Unicode range 65. So how does this work is that this is a hexadecimal. Um, so you can read it. So for the first uh, 125, it's, it's part of ASCII. So you can read it out from the ASCII table. So 65 is uh, E, lower character E. So if I type E over here, it will load, you, you can see the request being sent out. And if I type A, then you don't see it because I, I didn't add that font. But if you type F, then you can see it again, because that is 66, right? So you can use font, you can use, a, you can target an element, load a different font, uh, load the different fonts for different characters. And then that way you kind of know that what characters is on the screen or is being typed into the input. And that is uh, also being mentioned. And that is the technique that the key logger is using to, um, to, to basically sniff out what is being typed into the input, right? Uh, Sorry, uh, yeah. So so that is that concludes all everything that is being written in the in the blog that I understand as I understand it. Maybe you 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 figure out more things than me. Uh, maybe you should share it out with us uh, with me as well. Um. So sorry, it's like unrehearsed or un sorry unstreamlined because my thoughts is very cluttered when I was reading this and I was like trying different things as well. So that is my way of think, uh, my way of train of thoughts when I was reading this, right? So if 
I want to have like some summary on what we have gone through is that firstly, uh, CS, third party CSS is not safe. It's not as safe as you think. So uh, to be safe, you can use like CSP to load only files from a trusted source. And, and then to summarize what kind of vectors or what kind of techniques that you can take it out is that the first group we covered how to basically uh, modify the website, like adding content, remove content, uh, move the content around to break your webs to look to make your website looks as if broken. And the second half of it was talking about how to sniff data out from the website by reading it through attributes or loading a different font files so that um, when can figure out what are the characters that is on the screen. And that's all from me. Okay, let me stop sharing. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tan, for, for sharing this very mischievous uh, talk. Uh, I mean, yes, it was very, very entertaining. Uh, thank you for using uh, Singapore CSS website for your example. Uh, you also say uh, it's very fast. Uh, then we got here, we got here, we got pay attention. Uh, anyway, uh, if any of uh, Ali House manager is watching, he was just joking, okay? He was very lovingly making fun of the Shopee website. Ah, uh, okay. But anyway, round of applause again for Li Hao. Thank you for sharing. I think the examples made it much easier to, to understand. Uh, I mean, Jack's, Jack's article is very informative, but, but it's, it's, it's interesting to see it live in action. Uh, so any, anyway, uh, Probably zero people watching on the live stream. Never mind. If anyone got questions, uh, then uh, we will just ask them to Twitter you, uh, Mr. Mr. Tan, active on Twitter. Um, okay, okay. Going to close off already. Everybody, you all can go off and get on with your lives already. Don't worry. Uh, where are my slides? Oh my God. The level of professionalism is negative. Uh, share. Right, okay. Uh, normally, in real life, I would... Uh, this is the part where I tell people like, uh, do you have any announcements? Like, do you need a job? Uh, are you looking for employees? Do you need someone to babysit your cat? Um, but like, you know, uh, this is a this is a bit mood, so I'll just move on. And hey, what does it mean? Okay, uh, our best friend meet up very knowledgeable on sabbatical because you know everybody's tired. Uh, so there is a, there's a link shared. You all should follow them on Twitter and still subscribe to the YouTube channel anyway. But this link, they have had 85 RKs so far. It's a staggering number and you should go and like relieve, relieve this uh, magnificent event, uh, events, 87, 85 events to be exact. Uh, okay, our friends from Australia have... Uh, shared with us this discount code, Singapore CSS for um, Web Directions code. Uh, this is actually a pretty long running conference. You know, not meet up, they are conference, professionally run. Um, they have kind of had to rejig things for this whole online only era. So it's, uh, they've spread it across different weekends. So I think that that's, makes it more accessible for people. And uh, as their partner, we, we have this uh, Singapore CSS discount code. So if uh, the lineup is very, very good, like honestly, just go to this website, check it out. It's very strong lineup, a lot of really great topics. Um, if you still find it a bit pricey, I don't know, get your company to pay for it. They do have an, they're very, uh, I would say they're very flexible pricing options. Um, I think if you are an individual, there is an option for you to, for, for a much uh, lower cost ticket. Um, I'm not too sure about the details, but, but please do check this out. It's starting in two days. So yes, our friends from Web Directions Code. Uh, okay, okay, before, before I uh, close off, I have a shameless plug, my side project. Uh, okay, uh, like that law, uh, we are selling stickers. If you want to throw some money at us, uh, can. If you don't want to throw money at us, also never mind. Free shipping in Singapore, that is all. Okay, anyway, uh, 
that's it that's it for this evening thank you everybody for joining us uh thank you once again Nils and, and our friend who joined us I'm guessing Germany or somewhere in Europe because it was really bright where you were. Uh, thank you, our first time friends. Thank you, our long time friends. Uh, wash your hands. Don't touch your face. Don't touch other people. Okay, thanks. Bye. I'm gonna end the meeting now. But yeah, once again, thank you, Nils, for being here. Yeah, uh, I guess welcome. you can get on with your life now. <laughs> yeah, we'll go back to work now. There's uh, quite a lot of uh, messages that were coming in, Oops. colleagues waiting for me to to answer them, and uh, yeah. <laughs>